our case today takes us to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Home to 26-year-old Amara Banks and her children. Amara was known to everyone as Jerrica, and she was mother to Zaniah, who was five years old, Kamaria, who was four, and Arzal Jr., 21 months, whom everyone called Zell. Her ex, Arzal Ivory, was father to Zell and Zaniah, and was often around to see the children and take them to daycare, but the pair lived separately, with him being a few miles away. Jerrica was from a big and close family with five brothers and sisters, and one of her brothers, David, said her whole life revolved around her children. She put them before everything and would work herself into the ground to give every penny she had to make sure they had everything they could want and need. Jerrica was very talented and loved music, graduating from art school with honours and playing the violin very well. In the last couple of years, she had worked even harder to become more independent and break ties with Arzel. He told her family he wanted to marry her one day, but she said it wasn't going to work long term and there was nothing romantic there anymore. She said she only needed to talk to him when it came to the children. She had picked up extra hours working in the laundry room at the local hospital and had saved up every penny to get herself into a new apartment and start afresh with her children. Her girls, Zania and Kamaria, were said to be inquisitive and a bit cheeky, totally inseparable from each other, always wanting to dress the same and share everything. David said they were two peas in a pod. Sometimes you almost thought they were twins. Zell was always giggling and his sisters loved playing with him and carrying him around. But no sooner had she started on this new journey with her babies, tragedy hit Jerrica and her family in a huge and unexpected way. Her son Zell passed away, just short of his second birthday due to complications of bronchitis. Jerrica was inconsolable, but she threw everything she had into making sure he had the best send-off she could give him. She even set up a fund to help her pay for a Lion King-themed funeral for him. On February 7th, 2020, Zell's funeral was held. After the day was over, Jerrica and her two daughters went back to Jerrica's sister's house. Jerrica had some wine and asked her sister Mika to drop her and the girls home. The family made plans to get brunch together the next day, and Jerrica said she would pick up her car at the same time. The three of them got back to the apartment at the 5900 block of North Sherman Boulevard in the early hours of the morning, on what was now February the 8th, 2020. Just after 1.30am, the silence of the apartment block was abruptly and chillingly broken. A resident heard and then saw a woman running through the parking lot. She had no shoes on and was bleeding from her mouth. She was screaming for whoever was chasing her not to kill her. Then she was gone and it went silent. Little did they know it was Jerrica. Another neighbour also heard shouting at 1.51am. She lived next door to Jerrica and had heard thumping sounds against the wall. She said it sounded like someone being slammed against the wall or their head being smashed against it. She too had seen Jerrica barefoot and shouting, and as she looked out of her window, she saw a man following her and drag her back inside, slamming the door behind them. 911 were called. On the phone, the neighbour said, You can hear her screaming, you can hear it through the walls. I just need somebody to come check on her. He's over there beating the hell out of this girl. Police were at the apartment just nine minutes later, but could not locate where the 911 call had come from. A couple of officers drove through the complex with their windows rolled down and then parked up for 10 minutes to watch. They said they couldn't see or hear anything that was indicative of an argument or domestic disturbance and they drove away. The operator that had taken the call had classified it as a priority two call, which does not require an immediate response. The dispatcher did not pass on that the caller was living next door to where the noise was coming from, hence the reason nothing could be tracked when the officers arrived a decision which multiple officials would later admit was completely the wrong thing to do. As the hours passed and brunch was coming up, Jerrica's family were messaging and calling her, firstly to check on her and the girls, but also to see if the plans were still on. She was not answering the phone to anyone. Valeria, Jerrica's mom, said her daughter was a creature of habit. You always knew where she was and what she was doing. She had a clockwork routine, so they all knew in their guts that something was wrong. Even with everything that had just happened, she would not have dropped off the radar. You just know when you know, and her family wasted no time filling out a missing persons report. 
Police were then finally able to determine that the call that had been made in the early hours of the morning was actually about Jerrica. They entered her apartment to look around. There were no signs of a forced entry, but there was also no trace of her or her daughters anywhere, and all of their belongings were still there. They spotted a large hole in one of the bedroom walls, the comforter on one of the beds was missing, and they also found a napkin with what looked like drops of blood on it. But they said apart from this, nothing looked disturbed. Investigators soon determined that there had been no activity on her phone or social media accounts since she was dropped home that night, an immediate red flag for most people. Mika, Jerrica's sister, who had driven her and the girls home that morning, said, My sister, this is not like her. She don't run off, she don't ignore people. No matter what she goes through, she's going to reach out to me. While her family and friends started searching and calling anyone and everyone they could think of, police managed to make contact with 25-year-old Arzel, Jerrica's ex. It was now, about 24 hours after Jerrica was dropped home. Arzel told detectives that when he last spoke to her, she was, understandably, very upset about the funeral, and he had stayed for a while in her apartment, before a fight broke out between them. He told her he wanted to sleep in his truck rather than the apartment, and Jerrica had got outside shouting about it. He had to coax her back inside, he said. Arzel said the fight had then subsided, and he did head out to his truck to sleep before going to work the next day. He hadn't heard from her since. He said he had no idea where any of them could be, but added that he was going out of state for work and could talk to them properly the following week, but couldn't do anything for them right now. They found his reaction odd, and given the fact he worked as a local security guard, it seemed strange that he would suddenly be leaving to work hundreds of miles away, to then drive all the way back. They were now wondering if this could be a case of abduction. Breaking news here, a search for a missing mom and her kids is intensifying here tonight. Police have issued an Amber Alert for missing Milwaukee mother and her two children. Amara Banks, who goes by Jerrica, and her daughters Zania Ivory and Kamaria Banks were last seen last Saturday. Amber stands for America's Missing Broadcast Emergency Response. And these alerts are activated in the most serious endangered missing or child abduction cases. The aim is to instantly alert the community to assist in the search, and this is all broadcast through radio, TV, road signs and cell phones. However, the problem was Amber Alerts are normally a very quick response and call to make. But in this instance, it had now been almost a week since the girls had been seen. Given the fact that most Amber Alerts are resolved within hours because the response time is that prompt, and there are many eyes and ears on it, it was not looking good so much time had already been lost. Police Chief Alfonso Morales defended this decision saying, there is a criteria that goes for an Amber Alert for us to issue that. You have to understand that foul play was not an initial part of this investigation. He also said that Milwaukee police are only required to publicize information or photos if the missing person meets a narrow set of criteria related to age, health conditions and mental state. He added that they were working relentlessly to find the three of them and would not stop until they did. Last time the family saw those three was at the mother's apartment here just off of Sherman. Now nearly a week later, that family is doing everything they can to find them. We talked to multiple family members Thursday, all said the same thing. But this isn't like her. She wouldn't do this. This makes no sense. She always calls. Then the same thing about her job. If she's not going to be there, she always calls. And they all had plans to get brunch Saturday afternoon. Jerrica's car is still outside her sister's house where she left it. I don't get any reply back. She ain't been active on Facebook or anything. I've been calling her phone since the day she came up missing the last time. I've been blowing her phone up every single day. All of a sudden today, the phone is off. Is there a possibility that she decided to take her two girls and go on a vacation somewhere else and turn off yeah, her phone? we thought about that. We thought about that. We've gone through every scenario possible. Everything that she does routinely was not done. So it tells you that something's not right, that something's wrong. Given that everything had just ramped up, officers returned to Jerrica's apartment, this time with a cadaver dog. And in the girl's bedroom, the dog reacted very quickly. Forensic investigators then found the presence of human blood inside the girl's closet. In another room, the cadaver dog led investigators to a particular piece of carpet. When they pulled it up, they saw the floor underneath was absolutely covered in blood. 
It then became more obvious that a clean-up had been attempted, and vast amounts of bleach were found all over. Given everything that the neighbours had reported hearing that night, coupled with what they had just found in the apartment, the situation was far more concerning than they had initially thought. The search had now been on for almost a week, when police received a call from none other than Arzal's father. He lived in Memphis and said Arzal had just called him from there. This was 600 miles away from Milwaukee. During the phone call, his son had calmly confessed to killing Jerrica, Kamaria and Zaniah before buying a gun and setting off to Memphis to start a new life. Memphis authorities contacted Milwaukee police and a warrant was issued for Arzal's arrest and extradition, but they had no clue where the three were. When they finally caught up to him in Memphis, he was charged with aggravated battery. As Tennessee picked up the right hand, have they picked up Arzell Ivory, who's wanted in Wisconsin, or they got the wrong guy? 25-year-old Arzell Ivory appeared for the first time before a judge in Memphis. Back here in Wisconsin, Ivory faces an aggravated battery charge. He was still pretty calm and told detectives what his dad said was true and he would tell them what happened and where they could find the bodies. In a garage behind an apartment building in the 47th block of West Burley Street, close to where he had lived, police found the charred bodies of Jerrica, Zaniah and Kamaria. With great sadness, I'm here to tell you we discover the bodies of Amara Banks and her two daughters, Kamaria and Zaniah. And that's where we begin tonight. An Amber Alert ends in heartbreak. A Milwaukee mom and her two daughters found dead in a north side garage today. And the man accused in their death is in custody several states away. A heart-wrenching scene playing out for all to see at 47th and Burleigh Sunday. No! No, my sister, no! Online court records indicate Ivory lives at the address where the bodies were found, but police say that's still under investigation. Meanwhile, the family says they are simply beyond heartbroken. you got to be a heartless monster to do this to someone. My family is devastated. We're, we're just beyond, I don't know what to even say. It's unclear how or when Banks and her children were killed. But one thing is for certain. We're going to hurt every day. In the meantime, Milwaukee city leaders are calling domestic violence a serious issue that everyone must work to prevent. It raises many, many, many more questions than it does answers as to how someone could do this um, to a woman and her two children. There had been an attempt to dismember them. They had all been set on fire after they were dead. Autopsies would later confirm that all three had been strangled. Arzal Ivory's charges were immediately upgraded to three counts of intentional homicide and one count of aggravated battery. There was not yet any indication of how he would plead. Valeria said that if it wasn't for his father turning him in, they might never have known what had happened. It was a devastating outcome. Police said that between 2018 and 2020, domestic violence-related deaths had increased by 400%, and this particular case further highlighted that more support and resources needed to be put in place. Jerrica and all her children were now gone, four lives lost in the space of a month. The knock-on effect to so many was huge. A GoFundMe was set up to help cover the funeral costs, with the Milwaukee mayor calling the case horrific. He said, as a parent, as a person, you just have to be shocked by the brutality of it. During an interview, he gave police the grisly timeline of what had happened. He said since the pair lost their baby son, the couple's relationship had really broken down. And more than that, he said Jerrica had blamed him for the death of Zell. Zell had been born with severe respiratory issues, a constant concern for Jerrica. He was even scheduled to have surgery to remove his tonsils to help with his breathing. Arzel had tried to drop him at daycare, but they would not take him because he was too sick. He would not eat any food either that day, or take his medicine. Arzel had tried to wake him up from a nap, but said he wasn't moving and was making weird gasping sounds. Instead of calling 911 or Jerrica, he waited more than an hour before putting a now almost unconscious cell in the car and going to pick up the girls from daycare. By the time he arrived, baby Zell had slumped to his side, lying against the door. 
Arzel said he drove around some more, unsure as to what to do. He stopped to buy some snacks, and it was only after this did he go to the hospital. But it was too late. Nurses said Zell was blue and unresponsive, and they could not find a pulse. It had now been two and a half hours since Arzel had noticed he had stopped breathing properly, and at 5.17pm, just months short of his second birthday, he was pronounced dead. Jerrica was as angry as she was upset and said she could never forgive him for not doing something and just ignoring what was happening to their baby. Her family agreed and would later say he took four family members' lives, not three. At Zell's funeral, Jerrica had been very selective about who she wanted to speak and had asked her mother Valeria to give a speech. As she went to stand up, Arzel hurried to the front and just started talking. Jerrica did not react as she knew it wasn't the right time, but her family said she was absolutely livid that he could even stand up there, let alone talk. After the funeral, Arzel said he went to work, and when he went to Jerrica's apartment at 1.30am, she was angry and upset. She had shouted at him that he did not care about Zell, and had caused his death, and told him she couldn't even face looking at him. Arzel told officers she was just making a scene. Then he said something like, Ever since the funeral, she's been giving me attitude. And the way that he said that just struck something in me. And I immediately said, something's not right. He claimed she got a knife and cut his wrist. And then he had grabbed her and slammed her head into the wall twice. This was the hole that police had first spotted when they went in and what the neighbor had heard happening through the wall. She had started bleeding from her mouth and made an attempt to escape, but he dragged her back into the apartment and proceeded to strangle her with both hands. He coldly said it seemed that Jerrica was not fighting him back, so he figured that she wanted to die, and he was just helping her with this. He told detectives that he didn't want the children to live without their mother, so he had to kill them too. He kissed both girls and told them Daddy loves you, and that Mommy wanted them in heaven with her, before strangling them as well. He had planned to dismember all three of them, but changed his mind after he saw a bone likely where the pool of blood had come from. He then wrapped their bodies up and took them to his car. While he was driving around Milwaukee wondering what to do, he remembered that his old apartment building had a four-car garage and one of the locks was broken. He headed there to hide their bodies and tried to light them on fire, but the flames did not appear hot enough, so he went into a gas station for some gasoline, returned to the garage, poured it everywhere and set it alight. He then bought the gun and fled to Memphis. The sheer calmness in the way he described doing this was quite staggering to the officers. Arzel said that it was his family, and as he had brought his children into the world, he could take them out of it if he wanted. With a brief glance around the courtroom, this accused murderer kept his head down as he was seated for an initial appearance. State of Wisconsin versus Arzell Ivory. Extradited back to Milwaukee Wisconsin after police say he fled to Tennessee. Charged in counts one, two, and three, first degree intentional homicide. Many details of the crime, too gruesome and graphic to share. Finally in custody of the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office, his chances of being released are slim, despite the defense's request. $200,000 cash bail. The heinous nature of the incident and cover-up garnered something more significant. This is an extremely um, horrific um, offense, and therefore I'm going to set the bail at $750,000. Despite his shocking admission, he still pleaded not guilty and was held on a $750,000 bond. He then changed his plea to not guilty by reason of mental illness. But after many assessments in September 2020, a doctor ruled there was not enough evidence to support this, and it was thrown out as a defense. So in April 2021, the man accused of killing a woman and her two daughters reaches a plea deal. Arzel Ivory changed his plea, again, to guilty of three counts of first-degree intentional homicide. Under state law, he faced a mandatory life sentence, and the only question for the judge was whether he should ever be allowed to petition for release on extended supervision. His attorney detailed Arzel's schizophrenia diagnosis and past attempts to take his own life, and requested the judge allow him to petition for extended supervision after serving 40 years in prison. We're here for sentencing this afternoon. Mr. Ivory, are you prepared to be sentenced today? Yes. All right. Before his sentence was handed down, Arzel said, I have heard 
what the prosecutor said about what I did. I have heard about how what I did affected the family and loved ones of the victims. I know what I did has affected the world, but I am truly sorry and I regret everything I did. Many of Jerrica's family members gave victim impact statements in court, including her brother David and mother Valeria. You and you alone made the decision to end the lives of baby Z, Kamaria, Zaniah, and Jerrica. I said baby Z because even my sister knew you had negligence in his death. You have to watch your back every second, every minute, every hour of every day for the rest of your life. I want to read um, a note that Zaniah's teacher sent to her. My sweet, sweet Zaniah, you may be wondering why this is a thank you card. Well, I want to thank you for being you, being a light in everyone's world. The last conversation I remember having with you was when you ran up to me in the middle of the math class to tell me your baby brother was an angel. My last memory I have of you is eating lunch in the classroom with you. Oh, I wish I could remember what we talked about. I know I asked you what your favorite color and food were, and I'm so angry I can't remember what they were. I love you, sweet girl. Rest in paradise, Miss Palmer. Arzell's attorney's request of the possibility of an early release after 40 years of confinement was denied by the judge. At this point, Mr. Ivory, the court finds that the offence that you have committed, the offences that you've committed, based upon the entirety of the record that's before me, does merit as to each count, and these counts will be concurrent to one another, but as to each count, your sentence will be life imprisonment. And the court has determined, based upon all of the factors that I stated, that you are not eligible for release to extended supervision. And then that concludes our proceedings. I will, please, 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 please. Thank you. She also ordered him to undergo mental health and drug abuse therapy. You know, today was an ending, but there's still no closure. Um, justice was served, but there's no closure. And I tell people too that um, I have empathy for him because Every time we've gone to every hearing, my son and I, we've been there. And he looks around, and none of his family members are there. And I just, it just, really gets me. He did a horrible thing. But at the same time, he's somebody's child. And you still be there for your child. And, and I, don't, I just don't understand that. I'll tell you this. I've been fighting against the death penalty for over 20 years. <laughs> And my mom and I always had a disagreement about this. The reason I changed it, yes, because they were murdered, but also there's some people, in my opinion, they don't ever need to be let out, and he's one of them. There were also so many questions about how the 911 call was initially handled and what, if anything, could have and should have been done differently. People questioned why it had taken so long for the media to become aware of the case too. The story had taken a while to start circulating and that was only because Jerrica's family were calling the stations and not forgetting the Amber Alert, which was issued a week after as well. When the media reached out to the police to inquire about the case, they were told it was not a critical missing persons case. The internal investigation found that the 911 dispatcher had missed out vital information when logging the call made by the neighbour which had resulted in a lack of urgency to chase anything up. The operator resigned before the investigation was complete and she took a job as a prosecutor in the Milwaukee County District Attorney's Office before resigning from that as well. Michael Brunson, the acting police chief for the area at the time, fired the two officers that went to the apartment that morning for failing to conduct a thorough and complete investigation at the time. The officers appealed and got their jobs back. The panel of commissioners then issued suspensions instead, 30 days for the more experienced officer and 15 days for the lesser. During the hearing, an attorney said, in this case, these officers will never know what they might have been able to accomplish if they'd been given accurate information. Considering looking back at the day in question, could things have been handled differently? My answer is yes, one of the suspended officers said. The other one added, I've played the what-if game inside my head many times since this incident wondering if I could have done anything that could have changed the outcome of what happened. 
This is something I must live with. On Jerrica's last day, she was enduring the pain of losing her baby boy, who she said had such a painful and poorly short life, no matter how much she tried to help him. And just a few hours later, she too was fighting for her life. And for Zania and Kamaria, who we will never know if they saw what happened to their mother, suffered an equally terrifying fate. The Banks family must live with a pain that is hard to comprehend. Mika, Jerrica's sister, said she lives with so much guilt, I got a deal with it every day that I took her home, and now I will never see her again. In a touching tribute, the Banks family started working with the Sojourner Family Peace Centre in Milwaukee. Sojourner is a non-profit organisation that provides an array of support to nearly 8,000 people every year. They help families affected by domestic violence achieve safety, justice and a brighter future. They made plans to commission a stained glass window to be installed there. The glass will depict Jerrica, Zania and Kamaria walking into the sunlight together. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like to support our channel and help us to continue to make content, please don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. It helps us so much and we really appreciate it.